today we have a real treat, as you'll see. I got a little uh, preview of, of it this morning. I think you'll find it uh, extremely fascinating. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, pre-court uh, co-director Sally Benson, who actually brought uh, this topic and these speakers to our attention. Uh, next, uh, the person that she learned uh, about this uh, subject area and specific study, uh, Catherine Sandoval, who's a, a associate professor of law at uh, Santa Clara University. And one of these long, I'll do your resume backwards. The, uh, <laughs> so professor of law, uh, uh, public utility commissioner in California for six years before that, Stanford Law School before that, uh, the usual Oxford uh, 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 Road Scholarship, Road Scholarship uh, degree, and before that, the small little uh, liberal arts college in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, named the other university. No competitive juices there at, at all. <laughs> I'm sure we've heard this before. And uh, she had just recently written a book on this topic that uh, Sally and she uh, had discussed. So it's a very fascinating uh, kind of book about environmental justice, who some of us are now getting more involved in, in the specific killer case study that really, uh, I think, makes the chapter that uh, Catherine de, uh, uh, penned is on the Yurok tribe, uh, which is about six hours north. Uh, so she was able to convince two people, the uh, director of, uh, from the Yurok uh, community, the director of planning and uh, community engagement, uh, uh, Peggy O'Neill, uh, and uh, one of her star uh, staff people, Eugene uh, Gino uh, O'Rourke. Something about Irish and Native Americans <laughs> going, going on here. Got the text come down. So they're going to, as, as I understand it, it'll be a, a three-way talk and really focused on this very excellent uh, uh, example of a general theme, which I think is incre increasingly important uh, here and all over the world. So with that, I'll turn it over. I think Catherine is the first speaker. They have kind of a mixed sli a slide deck. So take it away. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Myers. So. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for being here. And again, thank you to Stanford for the invitation. Uh, so my name is Catherine Sandoval. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a law professor at Santa Clara University, also a graduate of the Stanford Law School. And uh, before going to uh, Oxford and uh, Yale for college, I started life in a trailer park in East LA, and then my family moved up to the barrio, uh, where we got to live in an apartment, and then we moved to Montebello, and actually Peggy and I figured out that we both lived in Montebello. So uh, I, like some of you here, was a first-generation college student, and uh, so I think also my experiences as a Latina uh, from East LA have also uh, made me very interested in working with communities that are uh, disadvantaged communities. And when I was a commissioner of the Public Utilities Commission, I was appointed by Governor Brown, served a six-year term from 2011 through 2017. Uh, I think one of the most important projects that we got to work on was coordinating with and ultimately supporting the York work of the Yurok tribe uh, that is located here in California on the Klamath River. Um, that parts of the reservation still lack access to electricity, and parts of the reservation now have access to electricity thanks to the tribe's leadership, um, and particularly that of, uh, of Peggy O'Neill, who has been working on these uh, issues for many years, as well as the whole tribe. Um, and that one of the things that I hope that we also get to talk about today is how Energy, um, internet, which I also teach communications law as well as energy law and contracts. Energy, internet, and water are interconnected infrastructures. So when you lack one, especially electricity, it is going to drive the lack of communications and internet, which also drives poverty. And part of what I've argued in my book is that Infrastructure poverty is structural poverty. It is community poverty. And so a lot of our strategies in the United States tend to focus on alleviating individual poverty or even family level poverty, whereas this infrastructure poverty really takes a different approach. 
So um, I will have at the end of the slide um, the uh, information on uh, how you can order this book. So this is actually a chapter of the book uh, called Energy Access is Energy Justice, the Yurok Tribes Trailblazing Work to Close the Native American Reservation Electricity Gap. So as mentioned, we're going to do this in a relay. So I'm starting out with some of the observations from my chapter and about uh, why, what drives this gap? And then uh, Peggy is going to talk a little bit about the Eurox projects to close the gap. So first uh, worth underscoring is that in the continental United States, Native Americans living on reservations are the people in America most likely to lack access to electricity. And that is still true today, although this is an issue that is not well quantified. And so this is definitely an area where we need more research. And in fact, um, this is a real gap here in California that we actually don't know how many people uh, don't have electricity. But one of the questions that we ask is also, um, you know, we're all taught in school that the Rural Electrification Administration electrified America. So why didn't it electrify Native American reservations? Well, for one, they didn't make Native American tribes eligible. So when you looked at who could apply, right, the boxes of categories that could apply, tribes could not apply for the grants. And as uh, we'll see, that that is still an issue today where there are a lot of grants and programs that tribes are not eligible. So in California, the places that tend to lack access to electricity the most are Native American reservations and farm fields. Right, so the Rural Electrification Administration electrified the farmer's house, but not the farmer's field. And so this is part of what drives especially diesel generators to be out in the fields, largely for water pumping, and then contributes to the terrible air, particularly in the Central Valley. So California is home to 109 federally recognized tribes, uh, more federally recognized tribes than any other state. And so the area that we're going to be talking about is represented here in the slide on the right, uh, the Yurok Reservation. Um, and you see there along the Klamath River. Um, and of course, what is the Yurok Reservation is a very small percentage of what has been the historical territory of the Yurok tribe. The Yurok tribe dates to time immemorial. And then as you had really with the gold rush, uh, the United States uh, pushing up into this area, uh, the uh, Yurok as well as the Hoopa tribe, the Redwood tribe, and many others were pushed into much smaller areas. OK, I don't know what's going on. Why is this? Uh, uh, we've got updates happening. OK, can we cancel the update? OK, let's not do that update now. OK, let's stop the check for update. OK, I'm not sure. Red button. OK, there you go. See, I love students. They tell us what to do. I teach communications law. All right, so um, so here, um, this is on the right. Actually, this shows what was the combined uh, Hoopa and Yurok Reservation. The area along the river was called the addition. That area was actually added to the Hoopa Reservation by President Grant. Uh, and then the Yurok Reservation itself, which is basically the area along the river, so the reservation goes for approximately 40 miles, um, one, one mile on either side of the river, was uh, created in 1988 uh, with the Hoopa Yurok Settlement Act. So um, what is amazing is that uh, somehow, in the great state of California, this area got skipped when it came to electricity and other infrastructure services. So Javier Kenny, who's the interim executive director of the tribe, observed in a uh, 2013 interview that swaths of homes don't have electricity, phone, or internet service. And in fact, Gino was telling me that uh, uh, when he, he moved from Hoopa back to uh, the Yurok Reservation to Wichpec in your first year living there, you didn't have electricity. Um, and Tracy Stanhoff, who's the president of the American Indian Chamber of Commerce of California, observed that utility infrastructure and services often stop just outside the border of many Native American reservations. In fact, they often go around them completely. So this is not a problem that is unique to California, but I'd like to suggest that this is related to a number of, of issues having to do with federal policy or the lack of federal policy, as well as federalism and the role of the states. So we see here uh, a, a stunning picture that was taken by uh, my former advisor, Bill Johnston, of the Yurok Reservation in the Klamath River region of what has uh, since 1850 been Cal the state of California. Um, it is a stunningly beautiful place. 
And, uh, but it is a place where electric and communications infrastructure uh, was largely absent prior to the Yurok tribe's infrastructure initiatives that really began in 1990. Although Peggy was saying that uh, she, her mother-in-law says that they had the old crank telephones in some places upriver, uh, which were probably a, a remnant of uh, the logging that uh, had gone on during that time. So I thought it was also important to, to start before we get into the why, right, with, uh, with the impacts and how big these impacts are. So this is the Jack Norton Elementary School. It is a state of California school that has uh, been run on the Yurok Reservation since 1959. It ran on diesel generators uh, full time until August of last year. So thanks to the work of the Yurok tribe and to the planning department leading this effort, they got electricity in August of 2018. Um, so not only did they spend, the school district spend a lot of money on diesel generators, but if any of you have studied about uh, diesel, um, it is very polluting, very harmful to human health, as well as something that we now increasingly recognize as a driver of, of climate change. Um, it, it's a two-room schoolhouse, so these are the younger kids. And so when, uh, when we were there, uh, Gino and Peggy and I were there in November um, meeting with the kids where they had just converted over to electricity and we had met with them many times before when they were still on diesel generators. We asked them, uh, how did they like it? And, they, and one of the kids said, I can now hear the forest. And then another kid said, I can now hear myself think. Um, but half of them still don't have electricity at home, and uh, neither of their teachers has electricity at home, so there are still remaining needs. And so this, the absence of electric infrastructure um, has contributed to ill health, uh, poverty, uh, has also limited um, economic and social opportunities, and um, as we said, uh, the high use of diesel generators is something that has contributed to pollution and uh, to climate change. So this, I think, is an area that is uh, uh, worthy of more study. You can see what the diesel generator was like there on the, the bottom. Um, so actually, through some concerted action as, as well involving uh, Dr. Smith at Berkeley and our, our collective work lobbying the Klamath Trinity School District, we got them to change to a propane generator. So now when the electricity goes out, as it did recently for, uh, for five days, at least they're running on a propane generator and not on diesel generators. So when we think about why does this happen? Why in America and why in California do we have people in California who don't have access to electricity? And so um, as a professor, I started looking into this issue and really came up with several major themes that continue to drive this gap. So these are uh, federal policies to fracture tribal identity, uh, to fragment tribal land holding, to funnel tribal resources to others, as well as federalism, right, and the role of the states, and particularly when states do not even consider uh, the issues uh, that affect Native Americans as they change policies. And fundamentally, part of the problem is that the federal government has never made pro uh, providing infrastructure, including electricity, telecom, water services, and other services on Native Amer to, to Native American reservations a policy priority. Uh, there is some money through the rural uh, utility service that is underfunded. They keep threatening to cut the budget, cut out RUS entirely, uh, but it has never been a priority. And one of the things that we talked about earlier is that there also are some federal policies that, for example, create a duty to forest management to evolving standards. But as any of you who've studied environmental law know that sometimes you have to kind of argue backwards, right, about protection of the trees in order to get to service of the people because these laws are really geared more towards trees or fish than towards people. So this is an example of um, part of the, uh, the fracturing of tribal identity, which was accomplished largely through fragmenting tribal land ownership. 
And so the Yurok Reservation really encompassed a huge part of the Pacific coast and then areas going inland down the, uh, the Klamath River. But as the federal government then created these reservations, also part of what they did was basically privatize a lot of the land. And so much of this land is owned as well by logging companies as well as by individuals, both tribal and non-tribal. So one of the things that Peggy will, will talk about is how this resulting checkerboard of land ownership and the lack of condemnation or eminent domain rights by the tribe has really complicated efforts to build infrastructure as in order to actually get condemnation, they would have to have either the county or uh, utilities such as PG&E could exercise condemnation rights or to undergo very extensive negotiation. So the idea here of uh, the fragmentation and fracturing really had one of its greatest expressions through the Dawes Act of 1887. And so uh, wielded like Thor's hammer at the heart of reservation, uh, this act uh, sought to basically break up reservations with tribal consent. And then the idea is that when all the tribal land was allotted, the federal trust relationship would expire and the reservation would be abolished. So the Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit in Matz versus Arnett uh, characterized the Dawes Act objective as uh, extinguishing tribal sovereignty, erasing reservation boundaries, and forcing the assimilation of Indians into the society at large. So the other point of this uh, policy, right, fracture tribal identity, get people to stop behaving in, in a tribal manner and identifying with tribe, fragment tribal land ownership, was in order to funnel tribal resources to others. And this is really exemplified through what I call the dam period, right? Um, and we see in the dam period, the building of very large dams uh, throughout America in the 20, uh, 20th century, uh, which reflected not only the federal government's view mm -hmm. of land and water as something to be tamed and brought under control, but also as something eligible to be funneled to others. And so in 1948, the federal government uh, launched what they called the Western Reconnaissance Mission to determine uh, whether there were surpluses in the Klamath River that could be redirected elsewhere. And when you look at actually the report, I had the opportunity to look at the report and my, my book chapter discusses this. One of the things that I found, uh, there's everything to find that is dismaying about the entire proposition. But one of the things that's also striking is that the report, the Western Reconnaissance Report, does not mention the words Yurok or Hoopa or Redwood or Kaduk or the names of any of the tribes there. It doesn't mention Native Americans or Indians. It doesn't mention that it was then a federally recognized reservation. So this is an example of what I call bureaucratic erasure, uh, 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 right? That they just erase the tribes out of the history book, which then also would have made their uh, proposal easier. So this is a picture of, uh, of uh, one of the dams on the upper Klamath River. And so their interim report had detailed this plan to dam the lower Klamath River where the, uh, the Yurok now lived. And this would have also flooded uh, where the area where the Hoopa and the Kaduk lived. And so this would have been, uh, the dam would have been on the, uh, would have been called the Apa Dam where the Apa tributary is now. And then they were gonna build a tunnel, a 222 mile tunnel to connect um, in the Redding area and then bring the water down uh, through the Bay Area down to Los Angeles. So this dam would have been as tall as the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco, would have been the tallest dam in California. And the only reason that this dam wasn't built was because of the objection of the city of Los Angeles, because the idea that the Bureau of Reclamation had would be that they wanted LA to give up their rights to the Colorado River water in exchange for water from the Klamath area. And LA refused to do that, and that was part of why this dam wasn't built. But when you look at the report, the report also mentions that there were only relatively minor improvements than existing. And in order to build a hydroelectric dam, you would need transmission facilities. And so if they had local distribution facilities, those would have had to have been uh, dismantled. So coveting this area for dam construction, the federal government uh, didn't fund construction of electric distribution lines or telephone lines to serve local residents. In fact, it had a disadvantage. 
And Peggy has told me that uh, her uh, relatives and, and people that she knows were told, look, this whole area is gonna be flooded out for a dam. Even after basically this proposal was pocketed, the proposal never really died and they told loggers to take everything possible because this is actually still on the books today and hasn't been retired. So there were still plans uh, to flood this entire area. So as I mentioned, this is an example of bureaucratic erasure where this report omits mention of the tribes and the areas to be flooded, uh, doesn't mention tribal sovereignty or tribal rights, doesn't mention that the Hoopa Valley Reservation was the dam site and proposed inundation zone. So um, as we mentioned that these aspirations to appropriate tribal water resources deterred investment in electric infrastructure, which again is particularly ironic. I put at the bottom here, uh, one of the uh, Yurok creation myths, right? Now the people will have enough to live on. Everything that is needed is in the water. And this is from the Yurok creation story, how thunder and earthquake made ocean. Um, and so uh, the damming in this area is still a major problem in terms of, of uh, fisheries and access to fish and food. So another big issue here is about the federal recognition of tribes and the role of uh, of the, the tribe in being able to, uh, to represent itself in both federal and state proceedings. So following the 1951 publication of the reconnaissance report uh, proposing to flood what was in the Hoopa Valley Reservation, and that was the, the joint reservation that was also uh, extended by President Grant, the Hoopa tribe organized in 1952 in accordance with the Indian Reorganization Act and obtained federal recognition. And then in 1988, uh, the Hoopa Yurok Settlement Act was passed by Congress, and then uh, it basically split the reservation into two and then recognized a separate Yurok and Hoopa reservation. And so this initiated also, uh, whereas the Yurok had been recognized uh, before by the federal government in a different way, this recognized the authority of the Yurok tribe. It actually specifically says in the act that the Yurok tribe are conferred the authority or recognize the authority to form in a way that would lead to formal federal recognition. And so they adopted the Yurok Constitution in 1993. And this is also important because one of the things that um, you look at in terms of the process of federal recognition of the tribes, right? it's important for us to recognize that the whole process of federal recognition is something that the federal government made up it's not inherent to indigenous tribes, right? This is a way of recognition that is effectively imposed on tribes. And so, um, so, but with this recognition, the federal government also now supports tribal staff. And so this has been critical to the creation of the planning department and the ability of the tribe then to be its own advocate, uh, to then advocate and apply for grants uh, to help to build the infrastructure. So the last uh, major theme driving this gap is federalism. And I say this having been a former commissioner of the California Public Utilities Commission. So coupled with the absence of federal policies to provide infrastructure access on Native American re reservations, um, this really drives the gaps because states are in charge of electric distribution lines as well as telephone line last mile, internet last mile, water services, sewer services. And um, many states, including California, shifted in the 1980s and 1990s from policies to promote universal service to policies focused on cost recovery. So actually, California in the mid-1990s focused on a cost causers pay policy, whereas earlier in the century, um, basically, you see these applications from PG&E that, sa that says, for example, we want to extend electricity to serve a sawmill in Glen County. And then the PUC would issue a one to two page decision uh, finding that in the public interest. So then you and I, all of the ratepayers, actually our parents uh, or grandparents, would have paid uh, as part of our bills for the extension of electricity. But by the time that the Yurok tribe was federally recognized, then the policies changed and the PUC never considered at the time that they changed the policy that there were people who still lacked access to electricity. And so under this policy, CPUC rule 15 and rule 16, 
in order to extend a line once you get beyond an allowance, right? And like the allowance could be, you know, this, this quad is really huge, this complex, right? Pro even from one end of the, co of the complex, this square to another you know, might be within the allowance, right? But certainly if you were going all the way over to where like the church is from this building, you would definitely be, be uh, beyond the allowance. So once you get too far, then the, um, the electric line extension rules kick in, and the minimum that is charged in order to extend the line is $40,000 a mile. Um, now, Peggy was saying that especially as they have had to add on and get farther upriver, the costs have been more like $500,000 a mile. So you can ask yourself, okay, if you needed to pay $40,000 to have electricity and another $40,000 to have telephone service at your apartment, would you have that now? How many of us could afford to pay $40,000, let alone $500,000? So this is why these rules really drive community poverty. But both state and federal policies didn't adequately consider unserved areas, including Native American reservations. <laughs> so tribal leadership has really been key um, in closing these gaps and addressing these gaps. Uh, many tribes have wanted infrastructure for more than a century. Um, and the Yurok tribe uh, has been a leader in really not only wanting infrastructure, but deciding as a tribe that it was important. Uh, so Gino um, O'Rourke, who's with the planning department, uh, his, his father was for many years the chairman of the tribe. And, um, and your father told me, he said, you know, we decided our tribe has existed for millennia. But to be successful in the 21st century and for millennia to come, we need the internet, right? You know, we, we through our tribal dances, can talk to, uh, to um, people, but we, we, we can't talk on the internet, and we want to talk on the internet. And they've recognized how important that was. So um, in uh, 1990, the tribe began participating in a CPUC proceeding called Smith River Power versus PG&E. And through this proceeding, they were able to, through a settlement, uh, get a small amount of money that they used then to help to fund matching grants. And really, through their great stewardship, have basically nursed these matching grants for 25 years. And so now that money has run out, and so they're having to look at new money. But even when you look at it, my, my book chapter talks a little bit about the history of this proceeding. Uh, Smith River Power had originally proposed to basically build a transmission line that would have, with the permission of the Yurok, crossed the Yurok Reservation to the Hoopa Reservation and really provided a backbone for power that would have <laughs> dramatically reduced your cost. But uh, ultimately, the settlement that the PUC approved gave pg e and Smith River the ability to choose between building the line that way or going along the coast. And they chose to go along the coast. So um, as a result, this is part of what has impelled the need for the tribe to basically lead and be electric developers to develop the line themselves. So with this, I'm going to turn over this portion of the presentation to um, Ms. Peggy O'Neill. And Peggy's going to talk about their 20 years of leadership in progress. Yeah, I was a lot younger when I started this. I didn't have gray hair. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name's Peggy O'Neill. I'm the planning director um, for the Yurok tribe, and I have been since the year 2000. Um, th these are my two favorite pictures for this project. So I put them first so you can see, and I'll explain them. You can see the terrain that we're dealing with. It's not an easy, flat um, surface, so um, it's, it's been very challenging and very costly to put power in there. This particular shot, and this is a real, it's not a Photoshop, it's a real photo of um, the military. We act, there's a program called the Innovative Readiness um, Program through the, the military, and they actually go out and do practice missions in areas in, in the United States, and they came out and they, they've done some of our power lines, some of the more difficult areas. And um, so this was, they loved coming out there, but unfortunately we went into um, war in the Middle East and they weren't able to come back because they were actually in Baghdad in Afghanistan putting back utilities that were blown up when they had the war. So that was kind of ironic. We couldn't get power, but they were over there doing it. And the, the other picture on, on the other side is my other favorite. This is on, on the, the smaller pole is a pole that was built by um, a landowner. 
using trees that were in the area and he created his own hydro system and he had his own little, his family all had electricity based on their own homemade hydro system and their own poles. And then you see the larger pole was the new pole that we put in, uh, PG&E put in, and they had a standoff because each side said, I'm not turning mine on until you turn yours off, and the other one wouldn't turn, turn it off until they knew they had power. And so finally we had to mediate the two groups so that we could continue on with our project. So um, those are my two money shots. I've used this one in, in grant applications, and it's been very, very lucrative. So in 2000, I came to work for the tribe, and there's a lot of things that the tribe needed, and I didn't just work on electricity. We needed phones, we didn't have internet, we needed road work, we needed buildings. We needed all kinds of things, and uh, water systems. We have surface water systems, so this was just one of the things that we had to work on um, power. And you know, my, my background, my educational background is I have a business degree in accounting, not engineering. But by the time I'd got to the tribe, I'd, I'd been working in um, Northern California now for about 40 years for tribes. And I had done both accounting, economic development, and construction. But I had never done a project like this. But the council said, we need you to do this, right? And so we tried to put our arms around, what, how were we going to do this? And we looked at renewables and alternative energy. And this is 20 years ago. And so you know, solar was more expensive than it is now, and they didn't have the battery backup that they have now. So we started looking at different options. We did hydro studies and wind studies and, you know, solar systems and um, everything. In our area, because of the, the weather we have and the, the tree cover, everything requires more than one type of energy other than the grid. And so... It, it finally, after a lot of studies, in, we did an in-river hydro system um, study. I went back to the council and said, we need a grid. We need to have the grid. And then we also need renewables, but we've got to have a grid. And this project should have taken maybe a couple of years. If I could have pulled it off in a couple of years if I didn't have a lot of obstacles, which I'll tell you about. But so in 2001, we started our first project. And we've done them in a series because we couldn't do it all at once. Um, we went through and we have to do the environmental, we have to find the funding. And um, we were really fortunate. Uh, we went back and lobbied and told our story to anyone who would listen. And um, the RUS has a high energy cost um, program. So if you can prove that you're, um, you're in a very high, um, you have low income people that pay a high percentage of their energy, um, their income for energy, then you can qualify for the program. And so that was our primary funder. We also went to the CPUC. Um, we went to HUD. We, you know, there was a variety. And we had our own some, we had about a million dollars in trust funds that she spoke about earlier. And we used that to leverage. We'd throw a couple hundred thousand dollars into a grant application. And we got $17.4 million over, over the years. And um, we proceeded to try to build this grid, which Gino's done a map over there of the various projects that we did. We wanted to make sure that we could have phone service, so we had to design it um, to, to include um, phones, so that required higher poles. Um, PG&E held us to a very high standard, much higher standard than I think anyone has ever been held to. They made sure that everything was you know, up to date and state of the art. In some cases, they weren't even making some of the parts yet that we had to come up with. but. Um, they made sure they never made it easy for us. And I could write a book on that. Um, but after this, this is a map of where the people live on the reservation for the most part right now. And there's sort of a disconnect. It's not that people didn't traditionally live in, in some of these other areas. But because of roads now and vehicles, they used to travel by boat. Um, and there were villages all along the river. Um, people are concentrated now in certain areas, and so um, it shows that the, we have two power companies. We have Pacific Power, and we're the end of the line of two power companies. The end of the line of Pacific Power from the north, they, they bring down hydropower, <laughs> and then we're the end of the line for PG&E. So then there's this disconnect in between about, I don't know how many miles, about 20 miles in between where there's no electricity. So when we're talking about bringing electricity, it's only still to a portion of the reservation. And um, we've had a lot of uh, resource extraction that's gone on over the years. Um, it started with the salmon and water that's been removed and taken to other places, the redwood trees, the fir trees. Now we've been inundated by cannabis growers. You know, so 
There's been a lot of taking resources out of this area, not much putting back. And she talked about the dam, which would have really put almost half of the reservation would have been underwater. Um, and then the other half at the mouth would have you know, been a little trickle of water coming down. But we still have a lot of people that don't have electricity. What we did to get to qualify for the um, grant funds, we had to go through and look at, you know, what does it take to get through a day on the Yurok Reservation without ele electrical grid? You had to have kerosene lights, batteries, you had to have propane, you had to have propane appliances. A propane refrigerator is a couple thousand dollars. Um, you had to have chainsaws and trucks and firewood. Most people lived off of the heat from, from f trees that they were cutting down. So it really cost a lot of money. So most people didn't use much electricity. They might fire up the generator to watch TV a little bit. They had a propane refrigerator, but they, you know, and then they would go and get these five gallon or, you know, like you'd put on an RV because they couldn't afford to fill the 200, 300 um, gallons worth of propane in a big tank. And they just, you know, operate with little small tanks of, of propane. So one of the biggest, I'm probably not going to follow all the slides exactly. Our biggest obstacles were um, getting the funds. And like I said, we went back and lobbied to get those. We went back. I remember I'd never been to DC before, and I'm not really one that likes to go around lobbying or talking in large groups. But um, I went back to DC. They lost my luggage. And I was lobbying back there in my tennis shoes and my jeans. So I think that they thought we must really need um, money because I looked pretty <laughs> pathetic. I had to wash my clothes out in the sink at night. So um, I think RUS sort of adopted us. and. Um, they kind of were committed to helping us get to the end of the road. And there was a couple times we had to go back and say, we don't have enough money to finish this project. And they'd dig around and say, well, we think we can add a little bit to your budget. And they've done that to us twice. And, and I really, um, I'm really thankful for that. I'm not sure how much more they're going to fund us, but they at least fund us to get down to the end of the road and to get the school. We have four surface water systems in that area. And surface water systems are very expensive to operate, and they require um, telemetry, which runs off of you know, electricity. Or we tried solar, but that, that never worked year round. So you know, not having electricity has so many impacts that most people don't, they just take for granted. Like you couldn't have food stamps at the store, and you, you, know, you, you can't use the internet. And there's a lot of things that you couldn't do up there. That, you know, renewables sound really good, but without that backbone, you couldn't have um, you know, net metering. You couldn't have. Um, with it out telephones, there's a low-cost telephone program that you can't participate in. You can't have reverse 911. There's a lot of things that we all take for granted that nobody there could have. So um, we had the bit, one of the biggest obstacles besides PG&E, and like I said, I could write a whole book on how hard they made it for us, um, even though we were paying for everything. But um, the hardest thing that I really felt was the power to condemn right away. We didn't have that right. That's only given to utility companies, to Caltrans, to counties, but not to tribes. So as we were going down, we'd, you know, they wouldn't even work on right away unless we paid in a, you know, the PG&E. So you'd have to pay PG&E for the project. And then they would identify who the landowners were. And then you would go about trying to get right away. And I could also write a book on all the stories about right away. and. It, it, <laughs> that we went through to get it. But um, the last uh, swath to get to the school was five years to get right away from one individual. And it cost us a lot of money. Um, and we were finally able to get it. But no one would step up and help us in that regard. Um, sometimes we'd have our legal department go out and start a probate for somebody. Because we have land that had probates within probates within probates. People never do probates because they didn't have the money to do it. So we would go find a likely. Um, conservator um, and say, hey, if we start your probate for you, will you sign our right away? And they'd say, OK, sure. You know, so our legal department would write up all the paperwork, go to court with them, get them named by the judge to be the conservator. We'd get them to sign the right away. I had all my staff became um, notaries so that we could get a right away at the drop of the hat, because you never knew when you were going to run into the right person. We had to find people that were missing, people that you hadn't been seen in years to try to get right away. And um, so that was the hardest. Besides pg &E, that was the hardest. Getting the money was the easy part. Building it was you know, not that hard. We, we could build anything. Um, we used a couple different methods to build it. Um, 
you can go out, PG gives you a choice. You can have them build it, which usually costs more, or you can go out and get contractors that are approved by PG&E and then they'll build it for you. So, and then we also use the military, which we had to sell PG&E on that um, concept. But the militaries are reservists and so they're actually the East Coast equivalent of the PG&E workers. They work for utility companies. They're not just, you know, just military alone. They actually have jobs, you know, the rest of the time. So, so we used all three methods. When we'd come to a really hard section, we'd make PG&E build it. Because if not, they'd just put us through the ringers and the contract would have change orders and change orders. So if we, like this last swath was underground utilities and so, and it went through some very, you know, um, bad sections. So we said, PG&E, you can build that one. And so they had to build that one. And then, then we still had delays because then they started having the fires in California. So all their workers had to leave the area. So they sat on our money for about two years. So, um, these are some of the reasons that, I mean, if you're engineers out there and you're looking at renewables, they sound really good and you know you want to be able to do them, but there's obstacles and you have to look at those. And what I found is that um, you have to have about three different sources of energy to get through the year. You know, you got, during the winter, you can't use solar, it just doesn't work. During the summer, you can't use hydro because your water flows go down and they, they degrade and so, um, it would, you know, the next error, the error that, that Gina will work on um, because I'm going to be retired will be to, to, to look at renewables. Once you have that backbone in that grid, but, you know, when you put a solar system in for an elder, which they had tried to do, it's very expensive and very, very um, problematic for them to keep it operational without having the grid as their battery backup. So... Um, we did all these studies and we're looking at, you know, we looked at biomass. We live in a forest. It makes sense to have biomass, but, you know, the technology hadn't quite caught up yet to where it is now when we started this project. And so you look at biomass, but it's expensive to go get it and to haul it around because you have to pay high fuel costs, you know. So you have to look at all the pros and cons. Is your technology the right size for what your needs are? And sometimes you have to have multiple uses if you're going to go with um, biomass. So we're still wanting to do all of these things, but um, if I'd known it was going to take me 20 years, maybe I would have thought differently, but um, I thought maybe five years to get the grid in, but it, it's taken literally 20, and we still have more to go. Um, so I don't, I don't have a whole lot more to say. I, I'd be willing to answer any questions you might have. Um, I think at this point. I have a few more slides. Oh, that we you want to see all of oh, my you slides? you want to talk about this one? Well, this is the kind of housing that we're dealing with. Just so you know, like one of the things is you have to connect the homes in order to get rebates back from PG&E because they, when they price it, you, you can't figure out how they do this, but they come up with a price and they said, do you want a, this option or that option? And we always took the cheaper option. But after you connect everybody to the electrical, then you get a rebate. So you have to get everybody connected. Well, when they live in houses like that that have never had electricity, pg and is not just going to go in and turn on the electricity. So in addition to doing the grid, we also had to have a program to try to upgrade the electricals in their homes so that they could accept it. So each home, we had a budget of about $5,000 because we were being pretty frugal because most of these houses need to be tore down. So we didn't want to go through and spend $20,000 on upgrading their electrical and putting panels in. And, you know, you've got to have a vein on the top to make sure they don't get electrocuted if there's an electrical storm. So we would have to go in and do a minimal amount of work so they could have a refrigerator and some plug-ins and TV and all that but not a full electrical um, rehab because it, it was just a waste of time, really. So let's see what other slides does she have. Okay. So you want to finish this up? The last part of the relay, and we can, we can do some of this yeah. together. So thank These you. These are her slides, the end ones. So. Right, so we can, we can talk together. So, um, so the, this last section is also just on suggestions, right? So you, we've, we've heard a bit about the gap, um, both generally in the United States on Native American reservations, on California reservations, including the Yurok Reservation. 
So what are the next steps? How do we solve this? So one is that I think we agree that the federal government should make uh, should prioritize and fund infrastructure to Native American reservations, of course, in consultation and with the consent of tribes. Um, and I say that this is a federal responsibility because the federal government basically created Native American reservations as federal enclaves part by taking Native land. Um, and uh, so I think that the federal government needs to take responsibility for infrastructure funding. I also think that uh, the federal government should not require these very high levels of matches, some of the programs that you have done. Or also the complicated, I'm a very good grant writer. I have probably brought in, you know, three or four hundred million dollars in grants in my 40 years of doing this. And so every grant, though, requires that you jump through somebody else's hoops that don't necessarily fit your project. And so if you're putting in electricity and you need to put in electricity, they shouldn't have all of these obstacles to make it almost impossible. CPUC does the same thing. You know, they were funding landline telephones. They've decided now to jump to broadband, but you know, we still need both. Um, but there's always somebody, and someday maybe some of you will be sitting in a position to write some of those NOFAs for state or federal agencies. Make sure you take into consideration that you know if you put in too many things, I understand you have to have accountability, but if you put in too many obstacles, you sometimes cut tribes out because tribes cannot meet all of those obstacles. We don't always have lots of matching funds, like Department of Energy requires a 50% match. Well, there's a lot of projects I'd like to do, but I don't have 50% match to do them. Right, and then as we've talked about, there are a lot of programs where um, it, it uh, you know, you have to be a subdivision of the state to be eligible. So in fact, we we're talking about one of the issues that will come up um, is uh, going to be with the PG&E bankruptcy. So we were talking about could the tribe uh, adopt their own community choice aggregator. But apparently the state of California legislation that authorized CCAs, do you know, you said the, the word that they used was it's public agency, public agencies, which are not interpreted to include Native American tribes. So that means that that under that legislation, tribes are not eligible to create a community choice aggregator. So we, we uh, can go back to the legislature, at least that's a California bill, get a whole new bill, get tribes in. But this is an example of some of the problems. So to address the matching grants, um, it, there is a need for uh, philanthropic help um, and uh, as well as the, for governments to rewrite the criteria so that you don't write tribes out of the criteria like the Rural Electrification Administration did. And the Yurok tribe is also going to be using its 501c3 to also seek matching grants. Um, I also recommend, and my book chapter recommends, that the CPUC should open a proceeding to evaluate the electric line extension and service rules for unserved or underserved areas such as Native American reservations. They've ad adopted these rules in 1990 without even considering Native American reservations. Uh, in addition, that uh, this is something that has come up very recently, that uh, the analysis of uh, the electric utility or energy utility restructuring with PG&E's bankruptcy, uh, that is taking place at the PUC. At the same time, PG&E has now filed for bankruptcy. Uh, I believe it is imperative for both of these proceedings to consider Native American uh, tribal issues and reservation issues to also have tribal representatives. And one of the things that I talked to Peggy and Gino about is that because of, um, as you build lines, then they can get uh, basically a rebate from PG&E as people sign up for the lines. This makes them creditors who are eligible to participate in the bankruptcy as a creditor of PG&E, which gives you a seat at the table. But it's important in both of these proceedings that the tribes have a seat at the table and a voice uh, as we look at if we are going to be restructuring PG&E, how do we do it in a way that helps to address these gaps and uh, really create a safe, reliable service at just and reasonable rates, which is, you know, the tribe wants what everybody else in California is, uh, is guaranteed. Do you have anything to add here? No, I think that, um what she's saying about the state, and I, I, I think it's got to be on purpose because I can't believe that so many people could always do this, but when the state writes a law or they write a, a funding or they have bonds, if they don't say 
Indian tribes specifically are eligible. They, they will not fund tribes. So we have to sometimes go through the county to get funding from the state. They, it, and I don't understand that. I don't understand why someone hasn't figured this out and it's universal that if it's, if it's cities, counties, nonprofits, it should also say tribes. Because if it doesn't say tribes, they will not fund us. And then this means that you have to be have to go to somebody else who somebody else becomes the decision maker about whether or not you get funded. Um, so we need more academic studies about uh, this issue. Um, so you know there have been a few studies that have been done uh, that through the Schatz Energy Center and these at Humboldt State and studies largely done by the Yurok tribe. But we need more documentation about the Native American reservation electricity gap and other infrastructure gaps. We need more coordination on this. And one of the things that also Peggy mentioned is that there's a huge need for um, energy efficiency and, uh, and other services. One of the things that we did when I was visiting there in November is we brought up some people from PG&E with us to really start the coordination because now that uh, uh, they have energized the line, so some of the people who live in houses like what you saw are now eligible for state of California programs like the energy infrastructure programs, the energy efficiency programs. Here's really, I think, the greatest irony, right? The people who have no electricity and have been running on diesel generators are ineligible for California's energy efficiency programs, um, for the investor-owned utility programs, and for, uh, as well, the energy assistance programs, the California Alternative Rates for Energy, because they're not customers of any electric utility. So the poorest people have not been able to access these programs. Now there are federal programs, but the federal programs are actually the poor cousin of our state programs. And so I think that this is another issue that again, this is a world that we have created. And in the world that we created, you had to be a customer of the utility to be eligible, but we didn't think about the fact that there were some people who were still not customers of the utility. So all of these issues need to consider um, how do we increase uh, tribal economic opportunities, social opportunities, as well as respect tribal sovereignty. Um, and then last on that, the tribal consultation is key. So this is a, another picture where you see the beautiful Yurok Reservation. This is their headquarters building in Wichipec. Um, so there's, a, there's Gino's dad on the, on the right, Chairman O'Rourke, uh, as well as several other members of the council when I had the opportunity to visit in 2016 to discuss our desire uh, to work with the tribe to study some of these issues, including the impact of the diesel generators and to, uh, to work with the tribe to see what we could do to help to address uh, the Native American reservation infrastructure gap and uh, the needs on the Yurok reservation. Um, this is information on my book chapter, and so we're gonna be uh, posting uh, the slides so that you'll be able to, uh, to see how you can get um, information to be able to order the book. We'd like to encourage you to encourage your libraries to as well order the book. Um, actually, when I, I checked the other day, and uh, it's on back order, um, but uh, if you email me, I can get you a, a coupon for a discount for it. Um, but if we can get your libraries to buy it, then hopefully they will publish it in paperback. And and uh, we, you know, we need more more studies on this. I think, you know, when I started working with tribes, I didn't know what the term environmental justice meant. Um, I just know that when something's not right, it's not right. And so I always walk into the room with, I don't care what you say, and I don't care what that, you know, NOFA says. This isn't right. And I try to train my staff. You know, don't just take somebody. You know, what they tell you is is the fact. You you dig into it and you find out. Well, why not? Why aren't we eligible? Um, and just it's gone a long way to to be um, successful in us being able to get ahead. Not only with with phones and um, power, but roads. We have atrocious roads, but we've been able to bring in millions of dollars in in improvements to our roads and our water systems. We've done $20 million worth of improvements to our six water systems that we have. Um, but everything is, is a big challenge when you don't have electricity, you don't have phones, and you don't have broadband, because everything is so interconnected. Okay. So those are the things that we have, to, um, we have to get out of the way so that we can do things like economic development. Right. You know, we, we did build a hotel and a very small casino. Um, to provide employment up there, but it, it's really hard to do anything in, until you get those matters out of the way, that, that infrastructure. So um, 
you know, in the future, the next generation, they can work on renewables and they can work on economic development. You know, people could have home-based businesses. They can do their um, telemedicine and they can, you know, all of those things that everybody else gets to do. This is just a beginning because, you know, even though we've done these projects for 20 years, we still have probably another 20 years worth of infrastructure work that needs to be done by the next generation. But I am retiring. I uh, retire actually from my position on the 15th of March. So, um, and I, I don't know what I'm, I'm going to be doing some, some work for the tribe still, but um, this is taken its toll. I mean, I, <laughs> these are like dog ears working for tribes. Not that they don't need people and that they don't pay well and they don't respect you and appreciate. I, I feel totally appreciated for all the work that, that I've done working with the tribe. My, my children are Yurok, my grandchildren are Yurok, my, my husband's Yurok, so, I, you know, my heart's in that place. But um, the next generation, Gino's generation, has to pick up the torch and continue on now. And, and I'd like to say also, it has really been a pleasure um, working you know, with Peggy, with all of the leaders of the Yurok tribe, um, both when I was a commissioner and then also back in academia. I could not have written this book chapter without, without you, Peggy. And so thank you so much for all of the help. And really, we did this through, uh, through partnership. Um, you know, our goal, at, at one point I, I said to Peggy, you know, I feel a little funny telling the story, but she said, you know, we're busy building the line and we need you to tell the story. Yeah. And um, so uh, working together, we need the help of all of you um, to, you know, help make sure that like when we met with those kids and they said they loved being able to hear the forest and hear themselves think, but they're still dependent on diesel generators at home and both teachers still have diesel generators at home. There's more work to be done. So you can learn more about the Yurok tribe through uh, yuroktribe.org. Um, uh, Gino uh, has agreed to also share his email address. So uh, Gino uh, can also be your contact. And here's my contact information at Santa Clara University and we'll make the slides available. So, so with that, once again, thank you so much to Stanford University, my alma mater, and also to the Precourt Energy Institute for your very generous invitation, and we'd be happy to uh, answer a few of your questions. So thank you very much. I'd like to say I really appreciate you coming here to share this story with us. Perhaps all of us can, uh, as you just suggested, help shine some light on the injustices that you've uncovered and make them less uh, onerous for you and others. And personally, I really admire the work you've done to kind of stick with it and get the job done, as Peggy just said. So any questions, particularly from students? Right in the center there. Um, can you actually elaborate on the connection between Sidney Farr versus PG&E and whether you want to actually sit in the upriver? We didn't have a choice on the upriver because that's where the power was and there's that disconnect. Um, I don't know why, but they decided to make our life miserable. And um, we were told this by people that retired while we were doing this project. They would come back and say, they are making you do things that um, they have never, I've never seen. You know, there was forms we had to fill out. They'd say, well, you have to GPS all the poles. I had my staff running all around the hills, putting tags on poles, doing all kinds of things. They said, well, you know, they're not, and we were just trying to be, you know, real helpful and do everything because they'd say, well, we can't electrify the lines until you do this. And then we can't do it until we do that. And this just kept going on and on. And finally, the final straw was um, we were doing a line and, and you have to understand we're in the Emerald Triangle. So um, if you don't know what that is, it's the cannabis capital of the world. So all, all around us are cannabis growers, you know, and we're having to get right away. And so we're having to go through and wave and, you know, and, and you know, all this illegal activities going around where the people had automatic weapons. Um, and so we're, we're trying to do everything we can. And then finally, the final straw for me was they said, um, you have to pay to upgrade the utilities because all these cannabis growers are going to be growing year round once they get electricity. And I said, that's it. I'm done. I, you know, I'm really done with you guys. You have asked us to do all this stuff, and we've done everything you've asked us, but I am not paying <clears throat> to upgrade the utilities with federal funds, because it's federally still against the law to grow cannabis, so that you guys can make more money. And I'm done. And I said, we have documented everything you've asked us to do. We have stacks of emails that we've you know, accumulated, and that's it. 
I just said, we're going to sue you. And I just made that up because I had no power to. <laughs> now I'm going to sue you. I turned into that Irma Brombeck or whatever her name was at Sue pg &E and e Now I can see a screenplay. Of <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe so, that's a good retirement job for you. So they brought in a new manager. And the new manager was a woman. And I thought, this is great because these guys, and they were guys, are not going to give her any more respect than they gave me or the other ladies. Because we were all women working on this project, and they weren't used to dealing with women. And we were good at what we did. We built things all the time. So we could you know, run around. And I had one worker who actually had a baby on her back running around the hills, you know, um, keeping up with them. And so the new manager comes in, and I give her the I'm going to sue you speech. And she's just like floored. She's like, I just showed up. Like, what do you mean you're going to sue me? And she said, give me a chance. Um, I will turn this around. And she did, I, to her credit. She's the manager of the, um, the Humboldt County facilities. And she did a really good job of getting those people out of the way that were giving us a hard time. And I think part of it was they really didn't see eye to eye philosophically with your people or with the growers, that we had no choice. They were there, and we, you know, you can't just skip over land when you're doing power. You've got to go and, you know, so you had to get uh, right away from the growers too, and you couldn't go in there and say, well, I'm going to have you thrown in jail. You know, they wouldn't give you right away, and no one was condemning right away, so we had to play nice with them, and um, that's just a little taste of, you know, some of what we had to go through. Another question back here. Let's take these two and that one, and I think we're going to have to wrap it up. You've spoken how these 20 years have proved much more difficult than you initially imagined. And so my question is, with hindsight being 2020, looking back on the difficulties and challenges you face, what would you have done differently, and how does this impact how you plan for the future now? Well, I wish that I'd had legal help. And I, I asked for it a lot of times, but no one really took me seriously. Because I think they thought we were had it all under control. But I wish that we would have sued them earlier and said, you need to condemn for right away, and you need to stop the behavior that was dragging this project on. Um, we could have done this project in a third of the time, I think. Um, that was That's what I would have done. If someone would have, I might have had to go to law school to do it myself because I couldn't get that kind of help. You have to understand that the Yurok tribe is doing a lot of things. I, I don't know if you know much about us, but they're also removing dams on the upper Klamath. There's a lot of competing interest and they kind of treated us like well you guys are you got it under control so you know that was something i would have done different so it sounds like i mean this is a social equity problem without any legislation helping you almost the opposite in some cases or you said with the wording it's almost like social or federal legislation is against you you kind of became an expert <laughs> of getting around that over the last two decades. How did you do that? Like, how do you literally walking into the room? Like I tell people, you don't have power unless you walk into that room and you act like you have it. And I do that, and and I've learned to do that over time and not to back down. And so when you walk into a room, you walk into that room like we deserve power, and you need to give it to us. And you know the same thing with the cannabis. I, I could, you know, was involved in a lot of the cannabis stuff, and we were on the negative end of that. And it's like if you think we're going to put up with this, we're not. We're not going to allow you to legalize cannabis and destroy our reservation. And that's what was going on, you know. So you just kind of have to bring that out and just say this isn't right. These people deserve more than this, and I'm going to fight for them. And and they kind of start listening. And they, they do know they're doing it wrong, I think. And they do know that if they got sued, they'd probably lose. So, And I think through these um, you know, partnership opportunities, I, I actually learned about the Eurox work through, um, through some meetings that we were having on broadband internet. And then learning about, wow, you just energized a certain part of the electric line in 2013. And then they said, oh, well, and we have a grant from Verizon which was actually awarded by the PUC in 2008. It was fully paid in 2010, and they still haven't performed on the telephone service. 
And so basically at the PUC, I was a commissioner at the time, uh, I talked to several of my colleagues and I talked to the communications division to find out what was up and why they weren't performing. Well, they said, well, it was the electric line. We needed the electric service to be completed. Well, guess what? The electric service was completed. So then I'm calling Verizon and then mention, they said, oh, we're going to finish it in a couple of months. A couple of months come, they don't finish it. So I said, guess what? I'm using my platform. So I started talking about it on the dais. I talked to other commissioners. I got other commissioners talking about it on the dais. Still, one use after another. And finally, I called the Western Region CEO of Verizon and said, I am going to the Yurok Reservation on April 2nd, and I look forward to being able to make a phone call to you from the Yurok Reservation on April 2nd at 1 p.m. from the school. And I'm going to make that call to you, and I'm so excited everything's going to be working by then. And he said, yes, ma'am, everything will be working by then. Uh, so, um, so we had a guardian angel that we didn't know about for a long time. We didn't know she was back there pushing for us. Yeah. One more quick question. I'm wondering if there's some way you can tunnel through some of this uh, regulatory morass, possibly by creating a city where you want service from PG&E, uh, you know, in, in terms of the state declaration. Melpitas, for example, in 1950, became separately incorporated. Um, I don't know what's... Well, we're, we're not... We are an Indian reservation. We are an Indian tribe, so we don't have to be incorporated. That that's we are a legal entity, and so we can't make ourselves subjected to state laws because that's against our sovereignty as a as a federal nation that predated the state. And that that's a shortcut answer, but. Um, so this is part of the legal issue, right, is that tribes are not a subdivision of the state, right? Counties, cities. But we're taxpayers. Are sub, right, and, it, but they're, and they are part of the state of California, but they are federal enclaves. This is actually part of what has driven, uh, as well as condemnation issues, driven infrastructure to go around tribes in some places and the lack of any federal policy to serve tribes. So, but I think that there are opportunities, for example, with the, the community choice aggregator legislation. And as we look at things like PG&E's bankruptcy and how PG&E should be reorganized, it is imperative to look at where are there access gaps that remain? Uh, how do we maintain affordability and reliability? And especially where they are is a very high wildfire danger area. And the wildfires are also part of what create issues as well right now with solar, because it's a, you see the pictures of the beautiful forest. This is a, a bit of sun right here, um, but often it's very shady. And then often nearby they have forest fires. And so the fires also make, um, make the solar uh, very unreliable. So even on a great day, on a great day in certain parts of the reservation, you might get power from solar for an hour. Right, and so then you're running on diesel generators and other things for the other 23 hours. And so this is why we really need to look at what do we need to do to promote reliability um, as well as to make sure that there is maintenance in this high wildfire danger area. Can we have a question over here? Thank you.